Welcome to the HPS Reactor Selection Presentation. This presentation will be broken into six main sections including what is a line reactor and the five things you need to determine on how to properly select a line reactor for basic applications. This includes number one, will a line reactor provide a benefit to your application? Number two, how to properly select a reactor's voltage? Number three, how to select the reactor's amperage or horsepower? Number four, how to select the proper impedance? And number five, determining if it's a line or load reactor. The goal of this presentation is to go over the basics of selecting a line or load reactor for a variable frequency drive, also known as a VFD application. VFDs are used to control the speed of an AC motor by simulating different frequencies and frequency determines a motor speed. The majority of VFD applications are easy to size and select a line reactor for if you can determine a few parameters. The discussion will focus on basic applications involving standard AC induction motors for both variable and constant torque applications and should be adequate for the great majority of applications you will experience in the market. However, if there are any questions on your application, please don't hesitate to call HPS and ask about the application. This is a typical three-phase iron core reactor. It has three coils and an iron core. Unlike a transformer, which has a primary and secondary coil for each phase, a line reactor has just one coil and does not provide the isolation or the ability to change voltage through winding ratios that a transformer does. While this appears to be a complicated picture, a reactor basically slows changes in current. By smoothing out the current, a reactor can help mitigate current harmonics and improve the power quality on the line side of a VFD and it can protect that same VFD from voltage spikes. A load reactor on the VFD's output also helps protect the motor from several issues which we will discuss. There are five main items needed for line reactor selection. Number one, will a line reactor provide a benefit? This is different from does a VFD need a reactor? In some cases the answer is definitely yes, a VFD will need a reactor. But in most cases the question is will the reactor provide a benefit? In most cases that answer should be yes. We also need to be able to determine the voltage of a VFD and motor. We need to determine the amperage or horsepower required for the application. We need to determine the impedance, which is typically measured as a percentage. And is this a line or input side reactor or a load or motor side reactor? Let's start with will a reactor provide a benefit? As we discuss line and load reactors, we will refer to this diagram several times. This represents a typical VFD with an arrangement for both line and load reactors. This is also wired in what is called a classic three contactor bypass arrangement. When contactors one and two are closed and contactor three is open, the drive can run. In bypass mode, if for some reason the drive has to be taken out of the circuit or is not running, contactor three is closed and contactors one and two are open and able to isolate the VFD. The line and load reactors are never energized from the across the line start starts since they are designed to work with VFDs and don't encounter the high motor inrush that is typical from across the line motor starts. Anything that rectifies AC to DC power is a nonlinear load and produces current harmonics. The line side of a VFD is basically a DC power supply and it's a classic three phase nonlinear load. Other large nonlinear loads can be include inductive heaters, arc furnaces, welders, and large DC power supplies and chargers. Overall, nonlinear loads now make up a large majority of utility loads. Nonlinear loads cause issues for utilities including power quality and higher line losses. Modern utility power meters increasingly allow utilities to monitor the added effects of nonlinear loads from individual users and allow utilities to charge penalties if a user exceeds harmonic values. The input or line side of a VFD uses rectifiers and is basically a DC power supply. This creates current harmonics when it transforms AC to DC power. As a result, our harmonics distort the utility's red sine wave to look like the green wave. The VFD's input section also has sensors to monitor the incoming power and result in DC bus voltage. Current harmonics can cause significant issues within the facility and if these exceed a standard called IEEE 519, the utility can find the user. The output of a VFD uses semiconductors to quickly switch the input voltage on and off in what's called a pulse width modulated or PWM output. By varying the width of the DC pulses, a VFD can simulate a wide range of frequencies from near zero speed 
to several hundred hertz and therefore control the speed of a motor. The PWM wave can have some unintended consequences which can cause problems with cabling and the motor that we will discuss later. Line reactors are found on the line or input of a VFD where it converts AC power to DC power. If line reactors are so good, why don't all VFDs have them? Well, it comes down to a couple questions. First of all, some manufacturers actually do have line reactors as standard in their VFDs. Economics also dictates that users may not see or understand the benefits of line reactors, and as a result, they don't see a cost-to-benefit justification, just like safety is not the defining factor as to why everyone buys a car. Finally, manufacturers can't always determine which impedance is best. We haven't gotten to the section on determining impedance, but it is a very important section that will be coming up. There are some situations where a line reactor isn't just suggested, but it's really truly needed. Number one, if the facility is being fined for violating IEEE 519 standards by the utility, typically the user will ask for a solution, and depending on the severity, line reactors will provide harmonic mitigation. Reactors may be a solution or may be part of the solution in this case. Reactors, though, typically provide the least expensive method for removing an amp of harmonics compared to other methods. A facility is being designed for IEEE 519 standards probably should have line reactors as well. Like number one, reactors may be a solution or part of the solution. Last, if a facility is being designed for meeting IEEE 519 standards and an active harmonic filter is being used, Active harmonic filters like our HPS TrueWave work like noise canceling headphones. Instead of canceling audio waves with speakers, an active harmonic filter creates current harmonics equal to but opposite to those created by the VFDs. Active harmonic filters benefit with each VFD having a line reactor. Really, anytime you hear the words IEEE 519, you probably need a line reactor at a minimum. If a customer expresses concern about power quality, then they really should have line reactors on their VFDs. This is a broad statement, but generally facilities such as hospitals, data centers, research centers, and the industrial operations, which must have high degrees of uptime, are all concerned about power quality and really should have line reactors on their VFDs. Finally, VFDs can start to experience tripping events, often the result of voltage spikes. This will often show up as input or DC bus overvoltage faults. While people often associate line reactors with reducing current harmonics, another very important benefit is their ability to help mitigate a variety of voltage disturbances, which can also cause a drive to trip. This will often, again, manifest itself as an input or DC bus overvoltage. Vacuum breakers or vacuum contactors can cause large transient voltage spikes. Facilities such as data centers often test these components daily. In those cases, again, you probably want a line reactor on front of your VFD. Finally, things like switching power factor correction capacitors or just plain lightning can all cause voltage spikes, which can be helped mitigated by a line reactor in front of your VFD. Customers are often not concerned about power quality until they actually experience problems. If any of these problems are occurring within a facility, it may indicate line reactors are needed. Note that other issues can cause these problems, but adding line reactors is often one of the first solutions to be considered, especially if VFDs are a major portion of the power load. These issues can include internal facility harmonic issues, which result in transformer heating and losses. You may see them result in incorrect meter sensor and communication data. Sometimes power factor correction capacitors will become damaged and fail. Uh, what happens is power factor correction capacitors actually act as a magnet for harmonics. So if you don't take care of the harmonics and have power factor correction capacitors in your facility, you can cause the PFCs to fail. You may see current harmonics result in nuisance tripping of circuit breakers and fuses. And finally, you will see the reduction of life in electronic components. Usually things like DC power supplies keep failing. This can be a hard one to diagnose because you don't know if the DC power supply failed after two years because it was just a bad power supply or was old, or if current harmonics or some other type of power quality problem caused it. But again, when you see a lot of DC power su supplies or other electronics failing in the facility, this is usually a symptom that they have some type of power quality problem. Here are some other general rules on when you need a line reactor. If a facility has backup generators, 
backup generators have to be sized to supply not only the motor load, but the additional current harmonics. By reducing current harmonics, line reactors may be able to reduce the load enough to allow the sizing of a smaller, less expensive generator. 24 volt open delta circuits, which is a picture of in the right hand side, are often associated with phase to phase voltage differences, which can cause current imbalances in the VFD's rectifier circuits. These current imbalances can cause the VFD's lifetime to lessen or to fail outright. Note that phase imbalances can occur in any type of transformer configuration, not just a open delta primary. However, they are most prevalent in 24 volt open delta configurations, and if I would install a VFD in a 24 volt open delta configuration, I would recommend having a line reactor in front of it. If the system's total nonlinear load exceeds 25% of the system's total potential load, line reactors should be considered. By the system's total potential load, I don't just mean if every single part of the system is on. I mean, what is the actual servant's entrance rating? So if there's a 200 amp service entrance, then I would say that if the nonlinear loads can exceed 500 amps or 25% of 2,000 amps, that's when you should always consider line reactors. If a transformer is heavily loaded above 75% for extended periods of time, harmonics can cause dangerous heating, especially if you are using a general purpose transformer and the great majority of transformers are general purpose. Line reactors should be reused to reduce the harmonics and therefore reduce this extra heating. Finally, generally VFDs below 10 horsepower, sometimes larger, don't have what's called a DC link choke. A DC link choke is a, another type of reactor that goes on the DC bus. The absence of a DC link choke means these VFDs put out more harmonics per amp of a load than other VFDs, and therefore they need to be strongly considered for line reactors, especially for facilities like warehouses where they may have many VFDs installed running, say, a bunch of conveyor belts. One thing a lot of people don't consider when they are trying to see if they need a line reactor or not is how big is the transformer feeding the VFD. This is not something a lot of people understand. It is common that a VFD is powered by a transformer which is significantly larger than the VFD. A large transformer appears as a low impedance source to the VFD which can cause overheating of the internal DC capacitor bank. As a rule of thumb, use a line reactor if the drive doesn't have a DC link choke and the transformer is su being supplying the drive is larger than 10 times the VFD's equivalent KVA. Uh, the equivalent KVA would be the VFD amperage times the voltage times the square root of 3 or 1.73. That's how you figure out the equivalent KVA. Or it may just be the KW rating of the drive itself. So again, if the equivalent KVA or the KW rating of the trans or the drive is one tenth that of the transformer and the transformer doesn't have a DC link choke, you might want to put a line reactor in the front. If the VFD does have a DC link choke and you do those same calculations, if the transformer feeding the VFD is 20 times larger than the VFD, again you may want to consider putting a line reactor in the front end of the drive. Here's an example. The smallest distribution transformer is generally 15 kVA. 10% of 15 kVA is 1.5 kV, kVA which is roughly 2 horsepower. Since many VFDs below 10 horsepower don't have a DC link choke, and if 15 kVA is typically the smallest distribution transformer most drives will see, I would suggest at the very least, VFDs 2 horsepower and below should have a line reactor. Keep in mind that the most common distribution transformer is 75 kVA, or 5 times 15 kVA. So if you look at the most common transformer, you could also probably say that just about any drive 10 kVA or smaller probably needs to have a line reactor considered for it. So far, we've been talking about the benefits of line reactors on the input to the VFD. Now let's discuss the benefits of load reactors between the VFD and the motor. Load reactors are found in the output of a VFD between the VFD and the motor. HPS Centurion line reactors are designed so the same line reactor can be used on either the load or line side of the VFD without any derating. Remember our discussion from earlier? By varying the width of DC pulses on the output of a VFD, a VFD simulates a wide range of frequencies and therefore can control the speed of the motor. This PWM wave, which you see up above, 
can have some unintended consequences which can cause problems with the cabling and the motor. These problems typically manifest itself as the motor runs hotter, the motor sounds louder, there's often this high-pitched whine or squeal at the top of a normal motor noise uh, curve, and finally, if there's a long distance between the VFD and the motor, an issue called reflective wave, which we'll describe, can occur which can damage the motor windings, often manifesting itself actually as bearing failures. A VFD output is not a sine wave. It's a series of square waves of change in width. By adjusting the width of the square waves, again, a VFD can simulate a wide variety of sine wave frequencies, thus controlling the speed of the motor. Now, something happens. When that DC sine wave goes out and is running down the cable and it hits the motor, the motor has a different impedance than the cable. And as a result, part of that pulse, that square pulse, gets reflected back. The amplitude of the reflection and the chance of this occurring are dependent on the rise time of the PWM, PWM wave, so how actual square is that wave, cable characteristics, cable length, and motor impedance. These voltage pulses can double or quadruple the base DC bus voltage. Keep in mind the DC bus voltage of a 480 volt system is actually about 670 to 690 volts DC. So when we're talking about voltage pulses, let's round this to 700 volts. So if I have a reflective wave and I have two pulses adding together, I can see a pulse of up to 1400 volts. And if I have two or more motors, I can get a pulse of up to 2800 volts. These pulses can damage and eventually cause failure of the motor insulation. Often before an insulation failure, the pulses weaken the motor insulation and they escape into the motor windings. Since the pulses are in the motor windings, they then have to ground and usually they ground through the motor shaft. Because they ground through the motor shaft, this often means that they go from the windings to the bearings. The bearings have a thin layer of oil on them, so the pulse actually arcs between the bearing trace and the bearings and creates a little micro pit in the bearings. One little micro pit's not a big deal, but because the drive is sending out these pulses at you know, 2,000, 6,000, 15,000 pulses a second, you can accumulate these little micro pits pretty quickly. And after a week or a month, there's enough of these little pits in the bearings that the bearings heat up and fail, and thus the motor fails. Remember, if multiple motors are used, the distance to each motor must be added together to determine the total cable length. For long lead length applications, the output carrier frequency should be set below 6 kHz and often preferably 4 kHz or lower. And by carrier frequency, I mean how many of those DC pulses are going out a second. How do I know if I need a load reactor on the output of a VFD to protect myself from these reflective waves? If we are talking about the reflective wave phen phenomenon, the need for a load reactor is often determined by the VFD manufacturer. Most VFD manufacturers will typically have lead length charts to reference. Typically, it's a combination of carrier frequency and lead length where the manufacturer will start to recommend an output reactor. Recommendations can start as low as 40 feet, but often start higher. While 75 feet is a good guideline for you to start considering, hey, I may need an output reactor, some VFDs may be able to go well over 150 feet before a reactor is recommended. Some maybe well below 75 feet. So just keep in mind, 75 feet is just a rule of thumb. As always, we always recommend you consult the VFD manufacturer's recommendations. Here is what a typical manufacturer's chart looks like when specifying if a VFD needs an output load reactor or a DVDT filter. We're going to use the two horsepower as an example. The second column is titled kilohertz and it states that the carrier frequency should be be between 2 and 4 kilohertz. It is usually recommended that the carrier frequency be reduced to 4 kilohertz or below for long lead lengths. You can see that the reflective wave can be limited to 1486 volts if no line reactor is used up to 270 feet or 83.8 .8 meters. Using an output load reactor extends this out to 600 feet or 182.9 meters. While not listed here, a DVDT filter could extend this to over 1,000 feet. 
to reduce audible noise and lower motor heating, use a 3% line reactor. A reactor can reduce a motor's temperature by up to 20 degrees Celsius and audible dB by up to 5 decibels when used. If you are trying to mitigate the reflective wave phenomenon, the drive manufacturer would typically recommend which technology to use. Reflective wave typically isn't possible for short cab cabling distances of say 75 feet or less, but that will vary. Most manufacturers will list much higher distances before this becomes an issue. A 5% load reactor as a minimum is recommended for distances up to 500 feet. While HPS recommends a 5% load reactor for lead lengths up to 500 feet, DVDT filters typically start to be considered for lead lengths starting at 300 feet and up to at least 1,000 feet. DVDT filters combine a load reactor with a filter board, often containing a capacitor and or resistor components, to improve the performance over a line reactor. Extremely long lead lengths over 1,000 feet may require sine wave filters and or drive isolation transformers. Long lead lengths often require an output drive isolation transformer to account for the resistive voltage drop of the long lead lengths and making sure that by raising the voltage we can make sure the motor receives the proper voltage at the end of the lead. Permanent magnet motors or PMMs are being more widely used. PMMs are more susceptible to high temperatures which can demagnetize the currents. As a result, they are more sensitive to the heating effects of a VFD's pulse width modulate output which creates eddy currents in the stator and further elevates temperatures. As a minimum, PMMs should use a DVDT filter regardless of lead length. Full sine wave filters may want to be considered even for short lead lengths. PMM applications also tend to operate at higher frequencies, which may need special or D-rated filters to properly operate. Question: Can a non-inverter duty rated motor be used if a load reactor or DVDT filter is installed? First of all, it's always recommended that you use an inverter duty rated motor with VFDs. Due to the wide var variation in age in non-inverter duty rated motors, it can't be stated with certainty that a line reactor or DVDT filter will fully protect a non-inverter duty rated motor if it's being used in a VFD application. As a minimum, we suggest using an inverter duty rated motor, but if you have to use a non-inverter duty rated motor, we would recommend that you use a DVDT filter on the output of the VFD. Question. Are there voltage drop concerns when using a load reactor or DVDT filter for long lead lengths? The answer to that is yes. So first of all, the reactor or DVDT filter themselves will cause some voltage drop. And if I have a line reactor on the input to the drive, I could have an additional voltage drop. Again, both these voltage drops would be equivalent to the impedance, 3% or 5%, let's say, of the line or load reactor. In addition to the voltage drops caused by the line and load reactors, long lead lengths will also experience standard resistive voltage drop in the cables. Once you do all the calculations, if the cable's voltage drop falls below the motor's capabilities, you may need to use something like an output drive isolation transformer or DIT. A DIT can change the voltage to account for any expected voltage drop in the cabling. And in fact, we've built output DITs that sometimes change the voltage 100, 200, 300 volts because of very long lead lengths. Please note that DITs must be custom designed to be used on the output of a VFD. You can't just take an input or, or a DIT that's designed to work on the input to a drive and apply it to the output. Question, if I use an output load reactor or a DVDT filter in a VFD, do I need to install a VFD cable from the drive to the motor? Uh, yes, it is still recommended that users install VFD cables between the VFD and the motor, especially in long lead lengths. While a reactor can mitigate some of the issues that VFD cables are designed to mitigate, they really work on a couple different issues separately. Uh, there's other issues such as low capacitance between the cable, uh, the three different cables in, the, in a three-phase cable, and EMI RFI interference that a VFD cable is really designed to mitigate that has very little effect if a line reactor or DVT filter is used. Now that we have reviewed number one, will a reactor provide a benefit? Let's review number two. What is the voltage that we have to use for a line reactor when applying it to a VFD and motor? 
let's select the voltage for an input reactor. This is actually usually pretty simple. Basically, what's the incoming line voltage? In North America, it's usually going to be 600, 480, 240, or 208 VAC. Note that sometimes it's not always, let's say, 480 volts. It might be 460 volts. And this becomes important because, remember, line reactors have a voltage drop. So if I have a 5% line reactor, I can have a 5% voltage drop. At 480 volts, 5% is 24 volts, which means that 480 volts go into the line reactor, 456 volts come out the output of the reactor. However, if I have a 460 volts coming into my system rather than 480, it just wherever I'm in the plant, I'm lower. That 24 volts not only becomes 23 volts, but it's subtracted from 460, which is basically 437 volts. So just be aware if you have lower voltages than, let's say, the standard 480 or 240, having line reactors, you really need to think about what the voltage drop is going to be for those line reactors, whether on the input and or the output. Uh, worldwide, you may see other voltages. HPS has sizing charts and software to select other common voltages. And for some reason, it's a really odd voltage that's not used anywhere in the world. Just give us a call and we can calculate what the best line reactor is for you. The output voltage for all intents and purposes is often the same as the input voltage. Noting that if I have an input line reactor that's at 3 or 5%, the output voltage of that line reactor is going to be 3 or 5% below. So just keep in mind that when I'm thinking of the output of the VFD and I have an input line reactor, the output of the VFD is going to be 3 or 5% lower than the input voltage. Now, if there's an input line reactor, the output VFD needs to be reduced by the percent of the reactor's impedance. Okay, so we already discussed that. And if you have some concerns, like if I should use a 3 or 5% line reactor, if I'm using both an input and output line reactor, you may need to limit one or both of those reactors to 3%, even though ideally you'd like to have a 5% line reactor. Again, if the voltage drop is too high, a decision has to be made to either maybe lower the potential impedance of both of those line reactors or to use just one line reactor in the input or output depending on what's most critical. A couple other things to remember. If the output frequency of the VFD is going to exceed 60 hertz, please consult HPS. Most VFDs have a 60 hertz input. You know, the AC sine wave is coming in 60 hertz and typically they'll put out a 60 hertz output but they may put out something that's higher. They may go to 90 hertz or 120 hertz. If that's the case, please let us know. We need to evaluate that. Also, VFDs don't always have to start at 60 hertz. They may start at a voltage that's at, uh, or are, don't always have to start at um, the same voltage that is the input. I can take a 480 volt input to a variable frequency drive, and for whatever reason, may not make a lot of sense, but for whatever reason, I can take that 480 volt input and I can create a 240 volt 60 hertz curve on the output. So it's rare that you would see that, but if you do, again, you need to be aware that the line reactor will have different uh, characteristics and it needs to be selected differently. Now let's talk about sizing a line reactor and should we use amperage or horsepower? Properly sizing a line reactor is the most critical and often most misunderstood part of the selection process. Proper selection of a line reactor's amperage is very important. While line reactors have usually both a current and a horsepower rating, ultimately line reactors are current rate devices and the horsepower rating is really there for a convenience. HPS line reactors current rating takes into account the extra heat harmonics reduced and is therefore already derated from the higher sinusoidal current rating that that line reactor could also have. We don't use the sinusoidal current rating for our line reactors because it's really not a practical way to rate a reactor that's going on a nonlinear load. HPS line reactors carry both a horsepower suggestion and a current rating. The current rating of a line reactor really should match, in our cases, we use it to match the National Electric Code or NEC motor rating charts for the horsepower and voltage combination. So when you see why did we select 24 volts or 112, I'm sorry, 24 amps or 112 amps for one of our line reactor sizes, it's because those sizes 
those amperage sizes are right in the NEC motor sizing chart for those amperages. Now, if a motor is measured in kilowatts, which European motors or Asian motors are measured, and actually anywhere else in the world pretty much measures in kilowatts, uh, you can use this amperage rating instead of the kilowatt rating. Or if you want to, you can also convert the kilowatts into horsepower. And basically, 0.746 kilowatts or 746 watts equals one horsepower. Now, don't oversize line reactors. Oversizing reactors creates lower impedances for lower loads, which would produce lower harmonic mitigation. There's very little benefit to oversizing a line reactor. Line reactors are designed to be fairly heavy and fairly rugged. They should be able to handle the load you're looking at. So again, don't oversize them. And beware of VFDs with different constant torque and variable torque current ratings. Often the variable torque current rating will be higher than the constant torque current rating. So if you are sizing it up, and let's say it's a variable torque application, don't size it up by the lower current or constant torque uh, current rating of that drive. When selecting line reactors, users often are faced with several different amperage values for the line reactor, the motor nameplate, and the VFD nameplate. To add confusion, the motor may also have a service factor rating, and the VFD may have different horsepower ratings depending on if it's being used as a constant torque or variable torque situation. In most cases, we are looking for the motor's base amperage without accounting for the service factor to size the reactor. Again, in most cases, we're going to size the line reactor based on the motor's actual nameplate amperage. The VFD almost always has a higher current rating than the motor. Since the motor is usually the limiting factor, it's the motor's amperage, not the VFD's amperage, that we're going to use to size the reactor. A motor's amperage can also vary by manufacturer, efficiency, design, age, and application. In most cases, both the motor's amperage and the horsepower will match the same reactor. However, if you know the motor's amperage, it's always a good uh, choice to double check that. Uh, again, often the motor's exam exact amperage may not be known. While it's always safer to use a motor's exact actual amperage value, it may be more practical to use a motor's or a VFD's horsepower rating to size reactor. Just be aware of the risk when doing that. Here is a motor nameplate that gives the motor's amperage rating. The amperage rating can vary from motor to motor even though they have the same horsepower. HPS's reactors carry an amperage rating equal to the typical National Electric Codes or NEC's motor amperage tables. The NEC amperages are typically higher than most modern high efficiency motors. Uh, HPS's line reactors amperage rating is rated to handle the extra heating caused by their harmonics so it doesn't have to be rated from uh, let's say a higher sinusoidal rating. Be aware that some other manufacturers list higher sinusoidal current ratings for their line reactors and the sinusoidal current ratings while look impressive actually have to be rated for the actual use because they can't handle the heat. If a motor has a service factor above 1.0 a higher amperage requirement may be considered if the motor will utilize that extra service factor capacity for long periods of time. However, typically when motors have a service factor, the users aren't planning on utilizing that extra capacity. It's just there to help uh, extend the life of the motor. But if you are going to tap into that service factor for extended periods of time, the uh, line reactor needs to be assized accordingly. A VFD often has an amperage kW or kilowatt, and a horsepower rating. VFDs, like line reactors, are ultimately current rated devices. The VFD's amperage is determined by reviewing the input rectifier and output IGBT amp ratings of the device. Since neither of these semiconductors are horsepower rated devices, the rating cor will correspond to a current rating and the nearest horsepower rating. Uh, often, a drive will have an amperage rating that is 10 or 20 percent above the actual motor's rated amperage. In this case, the drive is rated for one half horsepower at 480 VAC and 1.4 amps, even though the NEC charts list a typical amperage of only 1.1 amps. To add confusion, some drives often have different horsepower ratings 
if they are used for constant or variable torque gradients. A constant torque gradient is something like a conveyor belt where the torque is constant with the speed. So the torque at half speed will be half of the torque at full speed. A variable torque gradient has the torque vary by the square of the speed. So at half speed, the torque is half squared, 0.5 squared, 25%. This would be typical of fans or centrifugal pumps. When sizing a line reactor, you typically use the nameplate amperage rating of the motor, not of the drive. The only exception would be if the motor is significantly oversized to the VFD and the VFD has a higher amperage rating just in case you may decide to use, you know, in that case you may decide to use the VFD's value. But again, in almost all cases, you'll be using the actual nameplate rating of the motor. Or if that's not available, probably go to the NEC charts. Here's an example of a 10 horsepower Leeson motor that is being paired with a 10 horsepower Rockwell PowerFlex VFD. The NEC motor amperage is listed at 14 amps. However, the Leeson motor is only listed at 13 amps. It does have a 1.15 service factor, so theoretically it could see up to almost 15 amps. The Rockwell drive is rated for 17 amps. If we know the service factor will only be used for short periods of time during, say, ramping, we would size the line reactor as close to 13 amps as possible, not the 17 amps, since the VFD's electronic thermals would typically also be set at 13 amps to protect the motor. Using our selector software or charts, this would call for a 14 amp rated CRX0014AC line reactor if we wanted the impedance to be 3%. If we had size for the 17 amps of the VFD, we would have used a larger 21 amp reactor that would only have provided about 2% impedance at 13 amps. If we would have done this, we probably would have had to size the reactors, a 20, 21 amp reactor for 5% impedance to try and get closer to 3% at 14 or 13 amps. So again, this is why we want to typically size the line reactor for the nameplate ratings of the motor instead of the nameplate ratings of the VSD. Now let's look at how we select the proper impedance for a line reactor. Line reactors are typically sized for one and a half, three, or five percent impedance. Other parts of the world may have different standards such as two percent, four percent, or six percent. For the discussions of this area, we'll concentrate on just the three percent or five percent reactors. The one and a half percent line reactors are typically used in series with three or five percent line reactors in certain situations to fine tune impedance levels. Higher impedance means it will have better mitigation of issues including better mitigation of harmonics, voltage, voltage spikes, and reflective wave. However, a higher impedance reactor will also have a larger voltage drop, larger size, and higher cost. Some other parts of the world, again, may specify 2, 4, or 6% impedance levels. Usually in the U.S., if we see 2 or 4%, we will usually be able to size and use a standard 3 or 5% reactor because that meets or exceeds the impedance request and often our reactors will be most economically sized that way. To get a reactor closest to 2, 4, or 6 percent impedance if required, just consult HPS and we can run our charts to figure out what is the best uh, impedance voltage combination to hit those targets. Here is a chart and some general rules of thumb to select if a line reactor should be 3 percent or 5 percent. If a line reactor is being selected just for general input line buffering of harmonics or voltage spikes, 3% is often chosen. For more stringent harmonic concerns, such as mean IEEE 519 standards, a 5% line reactor is preferred. Saying that, there is no hard and fast rule, and 3 or 5% should be balanced between the concerns of power quality and the cost of installation. If an output line reactor or DVDT filter is being used, the system will have a potential voltage drop that is a sum of both components. Since an output reactor is usually 5% and a DVDT filter is often closer to 3%, the input reactor may be limited to only 3% because of voltage drop. If the VFD doesn't have DC link chokes, and this is typical of VFDs below 10 horsepower, we would usually recommend a 5% line reactor. If the facility is experiencing power quality issues, again a 5% line reactor is preferred. 
For output line reactors between the VFD and motor, if the reactors only be installed to lower audible noise and motor temperatures, a 3% reactor can often be utilized. More typically, the line reactor is being installed to protect for reflective wave phenomenons, and a minimum 5% line reactor should be used for lead lengths up to 500 feet. Now, there is some overlap with line reactors <coughs> and DVDT filters, where DVDT filters are considered for lead lengths up to 1,000 feet. There is no reason why a DVDT filter can't be used for even lower lead lengths, let's say below 500 feet or even below 300 feet. But typically, the cost of benefit analysis leaves DVDT filters to longer lead lengths or applications such as permanent magnet motors. Lastly, let's look at determining if we need a line or load reactor. Some manufacturers have separate reactors which are used on either the line side or the load side and can't be interchanged. Generally speaking, the load side is a little bit rougher on reactors and reactors need to be overbuilt a little bit for the load side of a VFD. HPS makes it easy in selecting either a line or load reactor. The HPS Centurion reactors can be used on both the line or load side of the VFD without any duration as long as the current ratings are met. Now that we've reviewed how to select a line reactor, let's look at where we can put this knowledge to use. Equals Light is an online mobile optimized configuration tool on our website at www.hammondpowersolutions.com. Just scroll down below the top of the page to get to the configurator or choose the configurator on the resources tab at the top of the page. Simply fill in the frequency, voltage, horsepower, kilowatt or current, and select the impedance. The system will then size the best reactor for your application. Once sized, the system will also instantly provide 2D CAD and 3D step files, nameplate information, dimensions and weights, the O&M manual, the product brochure, and a list of frequently asked questions including many we discussed today. If you are a representative or distributor, you can also use our website to apply for our full version of eQuotes, which will also give pricing and stock levels. Access to the full eQuote system can be requested by the Resources tab at the top of the website at www.hammondpowersolutions.com.